Hello everyone, welcome to Cherry Avenue Christian Church Online. It's hard to believe this is the last day of February. Now, Easter is just over a month away. And to help you prepare for Easter, we have Lent devotions each day. They're available on our website, on our app, on our Facebook page Monday through Saturday. The elders and I have prepared devotions and they're a great complement to your quiet time with God each day. And so we hope that you'll make use of those. And don't forget about our online Bible study. We have a new lesson every Tuesday, and I really encourage you to take advantage of that. Uh, we've been going back all the way to last, we haven't going back all the way to last spring when we started recording and posting them, uh, when we were early in our study in Matthew. And now we're in Luke's gospel, and I invite you to study God's word with us each week. And if you need to get caught up, they're there online. And midweek, we have our Wednesday encouragement to help keep you up to date on things and provide an encouraging word for you. So please make sure you join us for that as uh, it'll have any updates we need to provide you during the week. Scripture says a word of encouragement does wonders, and we want to provide that in the middle of your week. Each year leading up to Easter, we provide you with the opportunity to help decorate the church with lilies that you can then keep. And I'm praying that we're going to be able to meet in person by Easter or before. Uh, Amy Hill is arranging this for us. And if you'd like to provide one, they're $6. And you can order one by emailing Amy at the address on the screen or call the office and I'll get you her phone number. Now, one note, this is an updated email address. It's different from the one in the directory. And so if you don't use this particular email address, your order won't go through. Uh, with Rosalind retired, we're, we're not taking orders in the office. Amy's kindly volunteered to take them. So you can email her or call, and I'll give, her your phone, uh, give you her phone number. Uh, you don't have to pay up front. You can pay when they arrive. Just make your checks payable to the church. And I want to let you know how much we appreciate, how amazing you have been with your giving. It, even though we can't meet together, it means a lot. And if you'd like communion packets, you can come by. You can get those during the week. Just call and make sure someone's here before you stop by, and we'll be glad to bring those out to you if you like. As we come to our prayer time today, I want to remember Mark P. as he is having some hearing issues, and we want to pray for him as he looks to get those addressed. We also want to lift up Alan B. as he has his radiation treatments. We want to pray for Carrie H.'s family as his father passed away want to pray for comfort for them, as well as for Greg and Lisa B.'s family as her nephew Tommy Sillett passed away. And we want to lift up the family of Sue Carter, who also passed away this week. We want to pray for our local area, our local community, that the recent spike in COVID cases would drop back down so that we can begin meeting in person again very soon. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for the many different ways that you bless us. We're grateful that you have a means of worshiping and connecting, that you've given that to us even when we can't meet together in person. And Lord, we're grateful for the care you have for us, that when we have a need, we can bring it to you. And Lord, as we lift up these ones who are going through physical issues, we pray that you would bless them in the way you know is best. And we pray for strength for them as they go through these difficulties. And Lord, we lift up the families who've lost loved ones this week. We pray for comfort and strength for their families and that they would draw closer to you in this time. Lord, we pray for our community, that the COVID numbers would improve so that we can get back to meeting together so soon because we miss that so much. And Lord, we pray that you would be with us through the day, that the things we say and do would glorify you and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, we're in the middle of our series, Journey with Jesus, where we've been looking at the most significant events and encounters and teachings of his ministry. And after a time of worship, we'll have part four, Out with the Old, In with the New.
If there's one thing that our culture thirsts for, it's new stuff. You watch the latest episode of your favorite TV show, and when it's over, you're wishing the next one were available. I know with computers and electronics, something's new for about, oh, five minutes, and then there's something newer and something better. How many of you have ever bought something only to have a new and better version of it come out right afterward? It's so annoying. Last year, I bought a drone to replace the one I had crashed. And less than two weeks later, the company that makes the drone I bought released a new one in the same general price range that was so much better. I mean, it had a range of several miles, and most importantly, it had proximity sensors to help prevent crashes, which I obviously need. The new thing comes out, and, and we just crave it. Even among the things where older things are preferred, such as antiques, we could still have a desire to have some newness mixed in with the old. Now, if you're a classic car lover, you might want to cover your ears for a minute because I'm going to say something that's going to sound sacrilegious to you. My dream car is a 1964 Mustang that's been restored, but I want to have a push button where the dash panel opens to a large screen that runs a modern sound and entertainment system, navigation system with Apple CarPlay and wireless Bluetooth connections and automatic windows and locks with a key fob. I like the old generally, but I still want some of the new. The one place where new things aren't always viewed favorably is in the area of our faith. In our desire to preserve our beliefs, we sometimes go overboard and refuse new methods of practicing our faith. It's been said that the seven most common and deadliest words in the church are, we've never done it that way before. And it's a mentality with a long past. Jesus encountered it too even though scripture had predicted the new things that he would bring. I mean, back in Jeremiah, God had told the Israelites that he was going to establish a new covenant. But there was resistance to it when Jesus came on the scene and started talking about that. They, they weren't ready for that yet. We've been on a journey with Jesus through his ministry over the last several weeks. And one of the themes we've seen flashes of is that Jesus didn't come to, to make tweaks to Judaism. He wasn't dropping Judaism 2.0 that, you know, squashed some bugs and added a few uh, new features and a new look. He was establishing something completely new. And early in his teaching, he started dropping hints that something new was coming. There were hints, there were parables, there was teaching. And some of the most prominent teaching Jesus gave came in what we call the Sermon on the Mount, because this was like a sharp turn in, in terms of message. Now, we call it the Sermon on the Mount, but as we've said before, most scholars uh, of the Bible believe that it may have been, rather than one single sermon, uh, more of a collection of things that Jesus taught regularly in the different places he traveled. Uh, these were the things he taught to new audiences as he traveled in his ministry. And they took them and kind of put them all into one. I mean, John, the gospel writer, said, you know, we've only put down the most important things Jesus said and did. We couldn't include them all or the whole world wouldn't have enough room to contain the books. Now, that was a bit of hyperbole. I mean, he was exaggerating to make a point. But he's just letting people know that they've given us the highlights of what Jesus said and did. They've given us the most important stuff out of all of it the highlight reel, so to speak. So the Sermon on the Mount may not have been just one particular sermon, but it may be more of a best of what Jesus was teaching regularly in this part of, of his ministry. But here's the thing, and it's something that we often miss. This teaching showed his upside down, different from the kingdoms of this world view. It was so different from what the Jewish men and women who heard him had been taught that it was hard for them to wrap their minds around it. He starts out by giving a list of things that in God's kingdom are blessed, that are completely different from what people are used to considering good and positive things. So he starts out by saying things like, blessed are those who mourn. And if you remember from when we've mentioned these verses before, the word that's translated blessed here means how great for you. So Jesus is basically saying, how great for you when you mourn? How great for you when you're persecuted because of your faith? It's not really the thing that people look at and go, oh, good for you. But that's what Jesus said. 
Then he talks about things that go against the culture, being meek and merciful, being a peacemaker when there's conflict. And then he says in Matthew 5, 8, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. And the thing about that for Jewish people who are listening to Jesus was that this is an internal thing. They're hearing this and they're thinking, well, we've been taught all our lives that blessed are the ceremonially clean, the ceremonially pure, those who've done the right washings and kept away from contaminated things, staying away from Gentiles and never touching dead things. We were taught that it's those people who are pleasing to God. And Jesus says, no, things are changing. Blessed are those who are pure in heart because they'll have the ability to see and recognize God's work. And this is a whole new way of thinking for them. And then Jesus really blows their minds. He says, you're the salt of the earth. You're the light of the world. And they're thinking, wait a minute. We've been taught to stay away from the world. We don't eat what the world eats. We don't dress the same way. We don't marry them. We don't, you know, we, we stay away from Gentiles. And now you're saying that we're the salt of the earth. I mean, to be the salt of the earth, you've got to have connections there. And the, we're the light of the world. Verse 16 of Matthew 5 says, In the same way, let your light, let your life, shine before others. And they knew that meant Gentiles. And they're thinking, but we don't like Gentiles. We stay away from them. In fact, we're waiting for the Messiah to come and overthrow the Gentile government so we can have our nation back. And Jesus goes on that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. But we want outsiders to fear God, like back in the days of Joshua when they were taking the promised land. We want people melting in fear of God like they did back then. And they're thinking, this doesn't sound like what we've heard about the Messiah. This doesn't sound like Moses or the prophets. This is completely new. And Jesus knew their hearts, and he knew what they were thinking. And he said in verse 17, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. And this was huge. Remember, Jewish people in the first century didn't call their scriptures the Old Testament. Christians started doing that about 100 years later. Jewish people in the first century referred to their scripture as the law and the prophets. It included all the history and the prophecy and the poetry that we call the Old Testament now. But they didn't call it the Old Testament because testament means covenant, and it wasn't old to them. It was the current one. What we call the Old Testament, they called the Law and the Prophets. And Jesus says, I haven't come to destroy your Bible. I haven't come to alter it or abolish it or change it. And he said that because these things he was saying were making them think that he was. And he's going to say more that is going to seem like it if he doesn't make it clear. And so he says, look, I haven't come to abolish the Law or the Prophets. I haven't come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. I've come to close the deal. If the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, the Law and the Prophets, if they were an assignment, I've come to complete it. If they were a plane, I've come to land it. And eventually, I'm going to invite everyone to disembark. The whole covenant was about to be completed and give way to a new one. Verse 18 says, For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear... Not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law. And, you know, now they're breathing a little bit easier. You can feel the sigh of relief. But Jesus isn't finished yet. He says, until everything is accomplished, until everything is in place, then it will disappear. And that's just unfathomable to them. You're saying that everything we understand about approaching God and the temple system and everything associated with our covenant with God and the sacrificial system is at some point going to disappear? And you know, 40 years later, in AD 70, Titus and the 10th Roman Legion destroyed Jerusalem. And Judaism hasn't been practiced the same way since because the temple was destroyed. Now, here's the point of all this. Jesus came to introduce something new into the world. But in order for that to happen, Jesus was born under God's covenant with Israel. In other words, he was born to obey the law that God had given through Moses. He was born under the law, but he came to fulfill it. And this is the good news, to replace it with something new, something far better, a covenant between God and all of mankind. 
And all of Jesus' teaching and all of his parables were foreshadowing what was coming. There's something new. I'm going to complete the old covenant and start a new one, something better, something for the whole world. And even once the church got started, even after Jesus' resurrection, even 25 to 30 years after this, they're still struggling with this idea of a complete break with the old ways of doing things. And Jesus would, in this message, contrast himself with the old ways over and over and over. He says six times in this message, you've heard it said, meaning the law of Moses said, and then, but I say. You've heard it said, but I say. You've heard it said, do not murder, but I say, don't even hate. You've heard it said, don't commit adultery, but I say, don't even lust. It's a sin. You men, you've heard it said that if you write your wife a certificate of divorce, then you're good to go with God. And I say, not so fast. You've heard it said to love your neighbor, but I'm telling you, love even your enemies. And over and over, Jesus established new standards, standards that went further, that went deeper to the heart issue that the laws were based on. Jesus said, don't just do the right things outwardly, develop a godly heart. And the people are thinking, wait a minute, you can't set yourself up against what Moses said. You can't do that. You're saying your law is better than that, better than Moses. Who do you think you are? And he finishes up with something so powerful that we've been quoting it for 2,000 years. He said, look, I know I've given you a lot. It's like trying to drink water from a fire hydrant. So let me simplify it. Let me give you the Cliff Notes version of all of it. Matthew 7, verse 12 says, So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. He says, if you want the entire law in a nutshell, this is it. Do to others what you would have them do to you. It's something new. It's less complicated, but it's much more demanding. Verse 28, when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching. Why? Well, because it says he taught as one who had authority, not as their teachers of the law. See, the religious leaders, the teachers of the law, the Pharisees, they taught by quoting others especially other famous rabbis who had commented on the law. They were always focused on what Rabbi Goldberg said or Rabbi Shapiro said. Jesus was different. Jesus said, you've heard it said, the law says, but I say this. He taught with authority because he had the authority of God. After he'd been crucified and rose from the dead, he gathered his disciples for kind of a farewell address, his final instructions to them. It was his Newt Rockney speech we call the Great Commission. And he said this in Matthew 28. He said, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Remember how the people were amazed because he taught differently from everyone else that he taught with authority? Remember when he went into the temple and he drove out all the people who were turning the temple into basically a mall? And, we're getting, and people were getting cheated left and right. And the question they asked him at that time wasn't, what do you think you're doing? It was, who do you think you are? Because he spoke and he behaved with that divine authority. And he stood on the hill that day with people who had seen him killed and buried and now saw him back from the dead. And he said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And when someone's been dead for days and comes back to life by their own power, and he says he has all authority, you go with it. He said, I am the embodiment of the authority of God. And here's what I want you to do. Verse 19. He says, therefore, go. And this is the part that's going to be uncomfortable for them. This is the part that's going to push you out of your comfort zone, he's telling them. This is the part that's going to be different from what you were taught growing up. He said, but I'm here to start something new. He said, go and make disciples of all nations. Wait, not just Israel, Gentile nations too? Yes. I understand what you were taught about expelling foreigners and staying away from Gentiles, but I'm telling you that something new has happened. It's time to take the love of God to everyone all over the world and show them how to follow me. Make disciples. And here's how you do it. And he gives them two basic steps baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, 
share the good news with them, and lead them to put their faith in me in baptism. And then you teach them, verse 20, teaching them to obey everything in the law and the prophets, everything in the scripture they had, no. And this was so different for them. This was brand new. Teach them to obey the law Moses gave us, no. Teach them, and by the way, you know who the them is? It's, it's us, it's you and me. Because eventually they would take this message to Israel and to the whole world. Teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. And what did Jesus command? Well, watch next week and we'll begin to see that. And so the messages Jesus preached in the Sermon on the Mount planted the seeds of this new thing Jesus was doing. It showed the old covenant, the law and the prophets. It's kind of like a divinely created and inspired cocoon whose purpose had been fulfilled by Jesus. And that divinely created and divinely inspired cocoon released the love and the light of God into the world for everyone's benefit. This was Israel's purpose from the beginning, to bless all nations as God promised Abraham. And you and I are the beneficiaries of that thing Jesus was starting. 2,000 years later, halfway across the world from where Jesus lived, you and I have the opportunity to enjoy the peace and the joy that come from knowing we're forgiven and knowing that we have God's Spirit living in us today and the promise of eternal life in heaven. And our job is to share that good news with people around us who don't know about it. Our job is to be the salt of the earth and the light in a dark world so that people will see our good works and glorify our Father in heaven. It's our job to introduce people to Jesus and then help them get better acquainted. That's what evangelism and discipleship are. And we have the promise of Jesus' last words on earth. And surely I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Oh
Jesus' ministry was focused on bringing a new relationship between us and God, one where we could have a more direct relationship and where we don't have to try to get close to him by keeping an impossibly long list of rules perfectly. Jesus fulfilled the law and provided us not only with salvation and eternal life, but with the opportunity to live governed by love of God and others, not the law. On the cross, Jesus became the sacrifice for our sins and no further sacrifice was needed. And because of what he did there, we not only have the freedom from guilt of our sin, but freedom from the burdensome requirements of the law. And as we celebrate communion today, let's thank him for being the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Scripture says the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take the bread together. Scripture goes on in the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's take of the cup together. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for Jesus and his willingness to become the sacrifice once for all for our sins. We're grateful for the forgiveness we have through him, as well as for the freedom from the requirements of the law. And Lord, we pray that you would help us to live in that grace and to offer it to others. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're so glad you choice, chose to join us today. I hope you'll take advantage of our online Bible study every Tuesday, as well as our Wednesday encouragement and our Lent devotions Monday through Saturday. And if you ever want to talk about your relationship with Christ or being baptized, please let me know. I, I will be so glad to talk to you about that. You can just email me or call the office and we'll set that up. Hope you have a great week. God bless.